for coming everybody, my name's Holly, um, I'm a lecturer in creative writing but I'm also the um, coordinator of the research seminars here. This is the first research seminar of the season and it's a wonderful start and it marks a kind of fantastic um, kind of interdisciplinary moment which is you know the nature of our department as you all know. We've got some really wonderful ones coming up um, which I recommend unless it involves crossing a picket line in which case I wouldn't recommend that you go to them but do keep an eye out for um, the program throughout the year and the special guests and the wonderful speakers that we have coming and you're always so welcome to come we're always followed by drinks in the common room it's so nice to see so many students here tonight so please feel that these events are for you and whether it's particularly related to what you're studying or thinking about you you know you, you know this is part of our research community and you are part of that at whatever level you're studying so please come along and be involved um, I'm not going to say much today because I'm 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 very excited to hand over um, but we're very lucky to be um, to be to be to be hosting um, Dorian um, Linsky. I'm just, I always have that moment where I realise I haven't said someone's name out loud. Linsky? Yeah. Yeah, no. Dorian Linsky, um, a, an author of this amazing book. I'm actually also very excited about a book that he wrote um, in 2011 on protest songs, which is how I know which is how I know Dorian's work. And so I was just so enthusiastic when uh, our journalism guys suggested that he come here. So I'm going to kind of just fling it over so we can talk about the more specifics of this book, The Ministry of Truth, which, um, as, you, as you will all know, probably better than me, resonates quite um, critically and um, intensively with uh, current conversations. So, Paul, would you like to...? OK, thank you very much, Holly. I'm Paul Anderson, for those of you who don't know. Um, and uh, anyway, um, I'm asking the questions and uh, uh, Dorian is uh, answering them. Um, and well, hello, everyone. And uh, uh, thank you very much to uh, 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 Dorian for uh, coming here to uh, uh, discuss uh, the book, The Ministry of Truth, uh, the biography of George Orwell's 1984, to give it its uh, full uh, title, which was published in the summer to deserved rave reviews. Um, I bought it uh, on publication, and I think I've got the American edition for uh, uh, for some yeah. reason. Um, the American but, edition is the biography, right. and the British one is a, a biography. Because yeah. I thought a biography was just like, look, there, you could do this d differently. This is right. right. I like the idea of a personal thing, and the Americans are just like, no, that's weak. You have to say the biography. In America, if you, it's a big country, you've got to cut through. <laughs> well, there you go. OK, I bought it on publication um, and I devoured it in pretty much a, a, a single sitting over a, a, a weekend. Um, and I think it's the uh, best book on Orwell for uh, a very long time, which is actually saying something because there have been a lot <coughs> of very good books on uh, Orwell uh, in the past uh, 15, uh, 20 years. Um, OK, to sum it up very briefly, and I know that uh, uh, some of you um, have read it. I can see that some of you have actually got it on you, um, which is very good. Um, it tells the story of 1984, Orwell's last and greatest novel, by looking at the lived experience, reading and thinking um, that went into it. Then goes on to examine the book's enduring influence uh, in the 70 years uh, since it was published. And I'm going to start with a very general question, uh, which is this. Um, why did you decide to write about Orwell and 1984? OK, to play devil's advocate, it's hardly as if there's any shortage of accounts of Orwell's life, um, or indeed of critical work <clears throat> on this particular novel. Mm. Well, I was, I got interested in, um, dystopian literature and realized that I didn't really understand how it had evolved, that it was so, it's so much part of the landscape now. And I've always been interested in the transmission of ideas. So when uh, in music journalism, I'm always interested in almost locating that point where someone discovers a certain like guitar sound or synthesizer sound and, and, you know, pinpointing it and going, right, that was the first person. And I thought, okay, what's the, um, What's the origin of all these sort of dystopian tropes that are so sort of familiar that you don't really think about them? 
And then, and then I kind of, then that sort of led me to telling it through 1984. And then I thought, okay, well, there are lots of biographies of Orwell. Um, but I think if you take one work and you actually tell the story of the work, you don't have to stop when he dies, which generally biographies of people do have to stop then. Um, and also I thought that you could use that as a lens, and so therefore there are aspects of his life that, that aren't particularly relevant to the novel, which I didn't have to engage with. And there are other things that other people just wouldn't pick up on. You know, if you've got like a 400-word page biography, you're not necessarily going to go into his reading habits in, in any great depth. Yeah. And so it sort of felt, and nobody had, nobody had done that at that point. Um, and I just thought, oh, okay, this is something which, which enables me to go really deep into Orwell and his era, but also his influences and also the things that he influenced and to sort of treat it as a, um, to treat it really as a piece of popular culture, not just as literature, certainly not from an academic perspective. Yep. Okay. Well, the first part of the book is in part uh, a narrative account of the things that Orwell did that fed into 1984, in part a discussion of writers he read that had a profound influence. Um, you write in the introduction that you start chronologically with Orwell's experience <clears throat> in Spain in the Civil War, although in fact there's quite a bit on his life uh, um, uh, before that, um, as an imperial policeman in Burma, as a writer of reportage in Down and Out in Paris and London and in uh, The Road to Wigan Pier. But okay, another very general question, why was Spain so important? Well, he made it really clear in, in subsequent essays that it was a huge turning point for him in terms of his political understanding and also how he wanted to write about politics. He, you know, he, he says in the essay, Why I Write, you know, he says every word I've written since 1936, which means when he went to Spain, it was in December 36. Um, and there's also an essay called Looking Back on the Spanish War where he writes that in 1942 and he sort of updating and elaborating on some of the impressions that he had in Spain using language that ends up in the novel. So it's sort of a midpoint. So, you know, there's, there's phrases like controlling the, who, who controls the past controls the future. There's two plus two equals five. And so it really is like that is both looking back on the Spanish Civil War, but also the first expression, really coherent expression of a lot of the ideas of the novel. And the reason why it was important to him um, or well, the main reason, I think, was this um, understanding he had about truth and lies and propaganda. And he felt that with um, modern communications, that it was sort of impossible to have an entirely reliable view of what was happening in Spain that wasn't colored by propaganda on either side. Then he also had the very visceral experience of he was fighting with the you know, who became known as the losers of the losers, that it was the Poom who were kind of a small sort of quasi-Trotskyist group who were obviously unpopular with General Franco, but also unpopular with the communist-backed international brigades who had, you know, basically was the largest number of people fighting in Spain, also the uh, uh, sort of foreign troops fighting in Spain, also had the best uh, equipment, the, the, you know, Soviet money, basically the group that, Oh, well, the reason why all didn't do much fighting is because they couldn't afford to. They didn't actually have yeah. the weapons. Yeah. Yeah. And so they couldn't mount an assault. So they just had to sort of stand in the trenches hoping yeah. that eventually um, they would get enough guns to actually do something. Um, and then what happened was they were designated um, traitors. They were designated sort of collaborators with Franco, which was untrue. And many were arrested, imprisoned. Some of them died. People that Orwell knew. And he was sort of shocked by the blatant lie. And then he was disgusted by the fact that various uh, pro-Soviet newspapers like The Daily Worker in Britain um, just repeated that lie. And that is, I mean, that is such a visceral experience. If you've had kind of people that you have been with in very extremely difficult circumstances and they've been lied about in a way that in some way ruined or ended their lives, and then to have people, to have Daily Work or the New Statesman at the time repeat the lies that doomed them, it, it sort of filled him with this real sort of disgust that he knew he hated fascism, um, but that was when he also hated Stalinism. And 
he was quite a sort of head of the curve in that respect. Mm. Uh, must have been particularly kind of uh, uh, um, important to him that he actually fled for his life um, at the very end of the uh, experience in Spain, in, uh, you know, in that they were wanted by yeah. uh, the Stalin's secret police. Anyway, um, the next bit of lived experience that um, you give a lot of weight uh, to uh, in the book is Orwell's Second World War. Um, which he spent mainly in London, uh, living through the Blitz of 1940-41 and the V-Weapon attacks of 1944-45, uh, working as a journalist, first of all as a freelance, um, then for the Indian section of the BBC's overseas service, um, uh, Eastern uh, uh, service, um, uh, as a propagandist really, as much as, as a journalist, uh, in 1941-43, um, then as literary editor and columnist for Tribune, the left-wing uh, uh, weekly, uh, then briefly as a war correspondent for The Observer, um, and also, of course, writing Animal Farm. Um, the BBC is particularly crucial for 1984 uh, in many, many ways. Can you explain why? Well, he thought that he took the job at the BBC because he wanted to do something useful um, and his health meant that he couldn't actually fight. Uh, so he thought this was, you know, this was useful. It was also, compared to freelance journalism, uh, well paid. So we didn't have to sort of worry about money for that period. But he thought it was a waste of time because basically they were broadcasting to India and there were very few radio sets in India. And only a small percentage of those people who owned radios were listening to his programs. So even though the programs were, none, no recording survived, but a lot of transcripts do, scripts for them. And even though they were kind of excellent, you say propagandist, but it was mainly very sort of soft propaganda, which was sort of uh, almost sort of world service-y kind of stuff. So it was basically you know, talking about you know, literature and the arts. Um, and so he kind of quit because he felt they'd been a waste of time, but it, it actually was very useful for him um, because he was allowed to, he basically had sort of free reign as long as he didn't kind of, you know, clash, contravene sort of, you know, the war effort. Um, he was able to explore all these things he was obsessed with. Uh, so he was able to do things on Jack London's The Iron Heel, Gulliver's Travels, things that were huge influences on 1984. And he was able to understand propaganda because they would listen to Nazi propaganda. And so he was able to understand how that actually worked. Plus, it was his only experience of working inside a big institution. So the kind of physical detail of the Ministry of Truth, even though the Ministry of Truth is not meant to be the BBC, all the physical detail is taken from the BBC, you know, the canteen and the cubicles and sort of office life. And the you can tell that it was useful to him because as soon as he left, which was, I think, September, October, 43, yeah. he starts Animal Farm and he writes the outline for 1984. So it must have been, you know, all of his thoughts were developing during that period and Orwell had a great way of using whatever job he had mm. to pursue his interests. And so if you look at his, uh, before then, he was a theatre critic for a bit and a film mm -hmm. critic. He didn't really understand theatre. He didn't really <laughs> understand cinema. He didn't yeah. like most of it. Um, so it's not his best work. But wherever it told him something about totalitarianism or power um, or language or just, you know, human interaction, you could see him kind of it light up. You know, so even if it was some incredibly average sort of war movie, he would go, this is amazing. You know, yeah, yeah. this says something about it because he was always pushing his own. Um, he was always pursuing his own obsessions while being paid to, sort of to do something else. And then by the time he gets to Tribune, which mm. is where he starts after uh, the BBC, you know, he wanted to write a column. And someone said, why don't you just, you know, he says, I want to just write a a as I please. And so I think one of his editors yeah. said, why don't you just call it as I please? And it's the most amazing run of columns where he's literally everything that interests him. And fragments of almost all those columns end up in 1984. Indeed, indeed. So there was nothing, nothing he did was, was sort of wasted. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, um, next up, um, 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 okay, and this is the last question really about the lived experience rather than the intellectual influences, if you like. Um, Orwell's experience with an attitude to women, uh, which is, uh, well, uh, of course, um, uh, something that wasn't much discussed kind of in early biographies, except in so far, um, um, or in a critical reception of 1984, except in so far as um, his first wife, uh, Eileen O'Shaughnessy, died terribly young in 1945. Um, and his second wife, uh, Sonia Brownell, um, whom he married shortly before he died, uh, got a reputation um, as, well, uh, something of a gold digger. Um, now, I think um, you put that last slur effectively to bed um, in uh, um, 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 uh, the book, uh, though I must say I'm not actually, for other reasons, a great um, uh, Sonia fan, in part because of the way that she, um, well, basically held on to, uh, um, uh, in particular, his journalism and prevented republication of an awful lot um, during her uh, uh, lifetime. Um, um, I had Bernard Crick uh, uh, grumbling about it many, many moons ago, but that's another story. Um, um, but uh, um, okay, um, um, you you certainly look at at, 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 at at her reputation, and you deal very sensitively with the impact of Eileen's death, um, Orwell's subsequent loneliness, and his rather desperate search um, for a, a new partner, uh, uh, um, uh, basically making proposals of marriage to uh, well many, many, many of his uh, 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 women friends. Um, you discuss as well um, the influence of Orwell's 1984 on feminist dy dystopian uh, writing um, 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 at um, uh, some length, but you don't really um, address the criticism of Orwell's fiction by um, several feminists. That is, women characters are poorly developed, even one-dimensional, something that, well, comes to a head in that line of feminist criticism on with um, uh, Julia in 1984. Um, and the feminist critics argue that, um, well, her character, the way that she's portrayed, reflects a kind of deeply sexist mm. worldview that is otherwise demonstrated in Orwell's actual relationships, um, his lived relationships. Is that because you think that line of argument is, well, um, OK, barking up the wrong tree, or is it something that you've got sympathy with? I suppose the thing that, when you're trying to write a book that isn't academic, you know, the, the, there is a style in academia where you're constantly bringing out, you're constantly arguing with all these other critics who have got it wrong. That's the whole idea, is you have so-and-so writes, but I rebut this. And I thought, I don't like, I wanted it to be more of a, a, of a kind of narrative and a bit more show, don't tell. So one thing, because it is a very, you know, he inhabited a very blokey world. And so I did, wherever possible, want to kind of sort of bring to life not just Eileen, who's this very kind of brave, witty, principled woman. I mean, some of her kind of, some of the lines from her letters I just think are, yeah. are, are brilliant. They had a dog called Marx, and she wrote a letter to a friend and going, well, now we've actually read some Marx. He goes, you find him so annoying, we can barely look the dog in the face. <laughs> <laughs> and she was very good at sort of these quite cutting lines about, yeah. about George. Um, Sonia, I mean, there's a great, I mean, Hilary Sperling does a great biography yeah. of, yeah. of Sonia. So basically, she's, she's done the, the work there, really. But there were these other people like um, Ines Holden, who's kind of a rather forgotten yeah. figure, but was a really close and loyal friend and a really fascinating writer about um, the sort of about life during World War II. There was Celia Padgett, mm -hmm. who... He was kind of, he was one of the women, she, she was one of the women he proposed to. Yeah. Um, but they were basically sort of friends. And so I thought there were, there were quite a few important women in his life. Um, and so I just wanted to make, as where as possible, make the narrative a bit less male. Um, so with Julia, I don't know. I felt, I think the point <laughs> is about Julia. I think the point is in 1984 is that, is that it's, it's showing different ways in which you can live under totalitarianism. So Winston is the obedient drone who becomes a rebel. O'Brien is the fanatic. Then there are the various people that Winston works with, like Parsons and Ampleforth, and, 
and, and you know you just get someone who's just a coward and someone who's an ideologue and Julia I think is the most uh, modern the most interesting character because of what we've learned about totalitarianism since is that what a lot of people do, and this was, um, this is great stuff in Masha Gessen's book, The Future is History, where she's talking about these sort of psychological surveys of basically how people felt about the Soviet Union in the 80s. And most of them sounded like Julia, mm -hmm. which is that they mm -hmm. didn't believe in it, but they did, they knew how to go along to get along. And so they would, they would you know, the equivalent of where she does you know, turning up to the rallies, knowing all the right slogans, and then meanwhile just kind of trying to live as normal a life as possible. And so it's sort of very cynical, but it's a very understandable response. That, that actually, if you think about it, most people aren't fanatics or revolutionaries. Most people are just like, how can I make this system tolerable? And that is what I think Julia does. Now, the fact that she's the major female character, I don't think, I don't think means that he's assigning those attributes particularly to women in general. But I think that is the kind of role that she serves uh, in the narrative. I, don't also, I also don't think she was based on, on Sonia. Hmm. Um, but she was the character that in the second half of the book that I actually kept coming back to because people would just keep reminding me of Julia, you would, you would f see these quotes from people that lived in Russia. And it was like, yeah, that's a real Julia thing. And there's an amazing line that Robert Icke, who directed, co-wrote and co-directed the stage version of 1984. And it went to Broadway. And it was really acclaimed, but at the same time, the producer of the play had a revival of Hello, Dolly. And Hello, Dolly did a lot better than 1984. And he was just like, Julia would have gone to see Hello, Dolly. It was like she would not have wanted to immerse herself in the kind of the dark realities of things. She would have wanted like a bit of escapism. And so I, I find her really kind of fascinating, complicated human character. The fact that generally in, in Orwell's novels, he's not very good at writing about women. Um, I don't, I think that's too reductive if you're talking about Julia and all of the different ideas that are kind of poured into that character. Okay, okay yeah, okay. Um, moving on from the, uh, uh, um, you know, the lived experience, if you like, onto the authors that uh, I influenced uh, Orwell as he thought about, um, planned and wrote what became uh, 1984. Um, you devote one chapter to uh, Edward uh, Bellamy uh, one to H.G. <coughs> Wells, uh, one to Yevgeny Zamyatin, um, okay, um, Bellamy and even Wells these days, I would say, are little red. Um, I'm sure, I'm everyone here has read Bellamy. Sure. Well, I no, don't know. It's not, very, um, it's not a good read. No. Uh, and, well, Zamyatin has always been a little bit of a cult kind of uh, uh, thing, if you know what I mean. Um, okay, very briefly, and I don't want you to kind of sort of summarise whole chapters, right. uh, why did they matter? Uh, so that, I suppose that was going back to the original idea, which is I just wanted to go, well, how did we get these dystopian tropes? Yeah. You know, and it's a, it's a really interesting story. I found it surprising, particularly for the fact that the word dystopian um, wasn't really used until the 1960s, didn't really take off until the late 70s. So none of these books would have been called that at the time. They would have been called anti-utopian. And so basically the whole, you couldn't, you couldn't tell the story of dystopian fiction without starting with utopian fiction. And the Edward Bellamy Looking Backward, which came out in 1889, um, was this enormous bestseller. It was like the second best-selling American book of the 19th century. Um, and the first was Uncle Tom's Cabin which probably people don't read now either, but yeah, at least yeah, they've yeah. heard of it. Um, and it just started this craze for, um, because it wasn't very well written, it kind of encouraged lots of other people that weren't very good at writers <laughs> to, to write their own novels. Because basically all it was, was you decide your vision of the future, how you would like society to be, and then you would create, you know, somebody basically falls asleep for 100 years, 
or their, their hot air balloon crashes in a magical land, or they walk through a door, or whatever. So you basically project them into the future somehow, and then you describe the society that you want to see. Um, and there's a lot of explaining. The, the whole book is basically someone walking around explaining stuff. Um, <laughs> and because it was yeah. such a huge success, people were kind of ripping it off. And so you had one, like a, a guy who ran a department store, or wrote one called The World, a department store, in which department stores were the answer. And somebody, a, a golfer, wrote one about mm -hmm. called Think Golf in the Year 2000, which was a utopia where basically the whole society was set up in order to allow more time for golf. <laughs> so everyone had their thing. And then also that meant that there were people that thought that Bellamy, because he was trying to create an American version of socialism, because he thought socialism was too foreign and scary. And so he was going to do a very kind of like mellow American version of socialism. And so there were a lot of conservatives that, that obviously hated that, and so they would do their own, and theirs would be called like looking forward or looking further backward or a response to Edward Bellamy. Or, and there was kind of, it was almost like fan fiction, like anti-fan fiction, where they would take his characters and show it all going horribly wrong. And they go, well, if, if you do this, then the Chinese will just invade. Um, and so there was this whole weird publishing phenomenon. And all these books basically are forgotten. Yeah. I mean, they're all out of print, I think, except, except Bellamy's. Yeah. Um, so if you're a golf fan, it's very hard to get hold of <laughs> golf in the year 2000. Um, but H.G. Wells did his own response to Bellamy, which was called The Sleeper Awakes. And this was kind of the first effective and Im influential dystopia, because he'd written War of the Worlds, he'd written The Invisible Man, The Island of Dr. Moreau. He was like a really, really big deal. He was like a kind of, I mean, like a he was like a celebrity mm. novelist, um, stroke pundit. So even though this was one of his best books, Orwell was fascinated with it because he, it's, it's, you know, it really does set up a lot of this stuff. You've got this mega city, which has got a hierarchy and all the decadent rich at the top and all the kind of blue overall wearing workers slaving down below. Mm. You've got propaganda machines on street corners. You've got brainwashing machines. Um, and then what happened is that H.G. Wells, because he was it, sort of amazing but also unbelievably annoying, spurred this whole wave of fiction of people that just wanted to prove H.G. Wells wrong. And they would write, so that's where you, kind of where you get Brave New World. Mm. That's where you get E.M. Forster's The Machine Stops. Which is, E.M. Forster didn't write science fiction, but. He was so annoyed by H.G. Wells that he was like, I'm going to give it a go. And it's actually an amazing yeah. uh, story. But I think he wrote just for Howard's End. And you can't believe that the same writer did both. Mm -hmm. um, and so this sort of canon of dystopias was sort of anti-utopias was sort of building up. And all I was kind of interested in, in, in all of these. Um, and Zamyatin's We was also kind of a response to Wells. So there's this idea that you can be such a, you can be such an important figure, that a whole political argument is taking place in the form of fiction, which, I mean, all dystopias are political to some extent, but it it's not the same. It doesn't serve that same kind of almost essay in disguise role anymore. You know, the Hunger Games when that was successful, lots of people kind of wanted to rip off the Hunger Games, but they weren't sort of arguing with like her diagnosis of, you know, capitalism. Mm. It, it, it yeah, was, yeah. But back then <coughs> it was that everybody that wrote a kind of novel of the future really was trying to make a political point. Um, and so Orwell was interested in all that stuff. Jack London's The Iron Heel, which is a kind of berserk, uh, like a really weird story of um, a kind of proto-fascist regime taking hold in America. And the first half is all explaining stuff. And the second half is a bloodbath. So you're really bored, and then you're <laughs> horrified. And it's this very weird, but you know, interesting book that he was fixated on. And through Orwell's writing, you can see the books that he thought, OK, I can, what am I going to add to this? You know, what, what can I take from this? Where do I disagree with this? And so he, he was kind of always having an intellectual argument with the things that he found inspiring. And in that sense, he was kind of typical of the whole genre, which I don't think really became 
a popular genre until after 1984. It really did involve kind of digging around. Mo many of these novels were flops, yeah. you know, or you know, weird little cult artifacts. Yeah. But he kind of cre he <coughs> was sort of building this. He was sort of building this genre. Yeah. Okay. But the early U uh, the dystopians and, uh, and, and 19th century utopians are not the only key influences on uh, uh, 1984. And uh, well, there's another now long forgotten figure who's crucially important, James Burnham, um, uh, former uh, Trotskyist, renegade Trotskyist, uh, American uh, uh, writer whose 1941 track, The Managerial Revolution, um, became an unlikely bestseller, shall we say. I dare say that no one who's not interested in Orwell has actually read it in this room. Um, and it is pretty dire, but Orwell was absolutely obsessed by it, wrote about it sort of fi five or six times in different uh, um, 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 uh, places. And of course it forms uh, the basis for uh, the book, Emmanuel Goldstein's yeah. Uh, the theory and practice of oligarchical collectivism, he says, gibbering here. But uh, OK, it's today he's taken seriously by hardly anyone. Why was Orwell so fascinated? Um, well, Burnham was kind of like, again, kind of very annoying figure. Um, and he was, he was a kind of, he was America's sort of most prominent Trotskyist until he fell out with Trotsky and then did, completely gave up on Marxism. And decided that he basically had to build his own theory because he sort of didn't. It was almost like he couldn't live without an overarching theory of the world, so he had to kind of create his own. Um, and what I kept coming across in in research was how many of these books were surprise bestsellers. How many nobody knew that people wanted this until it came out. Um, there was no market for what you know for these mm. for these these things. That's true of Bellamy, and it's true of, um, of Burnham's book. And basically, he thought that the future would be what he called these managerial class, like technocrats, bureaucrats, engineers, mathematicians, um, would kind of you know, create a, a kind of dictatorship. Um, and he thought the world would be divided up into these three super states. And there's a lot in there that Orwell disagreed with. But politically, they were not aligned. Burnham ended up becoming like a hardcore McCarthyite, one of the kind of import, most important figures in modern conservatism. He actually left, he did some work with the CIA, and he actually left the CIA because they weren't anti-communist enough, which, which shows you <laughs> how far to the right he was. Yeah. Um, but Orwell was obsessed with these, like he kept writing about him, and Burnham hated it, because it, I think he said to a friend, he's like, this Orwell business is becoming a plague as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, yeah. Um, but Orwell did like the idea of this sort of managerial dictatorship. And he did like the idea of the three super states. And so he did work them in to 1984. So what he was doing generally with 1984 was that he would, he would find someone that fascinated him. And then he would sort of tear them apart on the page and then just keep the bits that remained after this shredding. Um, so a lot of the influences on 1984 are people that he was very harsh on about. Oh yeah, 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 absolutely. One of the many uncanny things about the book um, is the way that it describes aspects of everyday life in totalitarian societies, Nazi Germany, fascist Italy, occupied Europe in the, uh, uh, between 1940 and 1945, the Soviet Union and its post-1945 satellites. So. Um, and it's actually something that uh, um, um, Masha Gessen is very good on, yeah. is the extraordinary way in which uh, Orwell, never having lived or even visited um, uh, uh, a totalitarian society, manages to pick up absolutely all sorts of things mm. about everyday life, um, um, you know, right down to the, uh, the, the, uh, um, the elevator that doesn't work or what have you, the kind of really mundane details that are recognised by uh, uh, people who lived through it as being absolutely accurate and truthful. Where did he get that from? Well, there's a really, there's a really wonderful essay, I think by... He's an Eastern European writer, I can't remember, maybe a Polish writer. He said that when he said, 
when he read 1984 and it was banned, read a, a legal copy, he said he felt seen for the, the first time. He mm. felt somebody understands. And there's a line where, um, in 1984, where Winston is reading Goldstein's book and he goes, the best books are the ones that tell you what you already know. And this Polish, I think, writer quoted that and he was like, yes, this is, this is my lived experience. Mm -hmm. And this writer that lived, you know, 30 years ago yeah, yeah, yeah. in England and never knew, he kind of got it right. Yeah. And what I found was it was just, if you set, well, not if you, if George Orwell <laughs> sets his mind to understanding something and, and turns to every possible source, and this included you know, and again, most of these books kind of forgotten out of print, but there would be memoirs. Um, you know, the first wave of memoirs of, of life under Stalinism. Mm -hmm. um, it's fascinating accounts of people journeying through Nazi Germany before the war. Um, you know, pol sort of political thrillers, people that he met, just conversations he would have. And it was almost like nothing was wasted. Every little insight um, that he could pick up, and, he, and uh, many of them did overlap because, of course, that was the reality. And so he just sort of assimilated all of these different sources and sort of weighed them up against each other and presented a kind of hybrid of Stalin's Russia and Nazi Germany. But also, I don't think he was trying particularly with Mussolini's Italy, but accounts of Mussolini's Italy, mm. again, you know, you, the, the idea of Big Brother's face being everywhere. That was true of Stalin, but it was also true of Mussolini. Mm. And maybe, I, don't, I couldn't speak as confidently about, about Hitler. Um, but you know, so he was, he was looking at the sort of commonalities of totalitarianism. He was trying to work out what totalitarianism was and how it worked and how it was sustained and how it, what it did to people's minds. And he was trying to do this from very early on. And anybody who was working in that field, uh, he was reading them. And he was lucky to, to meet a lot of these people because a lot of them, of course, were exiles. They weren't living in Germany or Russia mm. anymore. And so he mm. would come across them in London uh, when he was briefly in Paris. Um, and I, I did find that really inspiring, the idea that there was that you could, if you just had the right sort of approach and curiosity and discipline, that you could kind of get it right without having been there yourself. Yeah, indeed, indeed. He's great friends with uh, Kerstler, uh, with Eden Anderson, with uh, uh, Struve, and with all sorts of other people that uh, uh, were uh, in London during the during the um, uh, 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 40s. Move on to part two of, uh, of um, 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 the Ministry of Truth, uh, which is uh, devoted to what you call the afterlife of 1984. Uh, it's critical reception on publication, the attempts of the Cold War right uh, to appropriate it in the 1950s and the parallel hostility of, well, the Cold War left, um, the pro-Soviet uh, uh, left. Um, it's adaptate, well, the various adaptations for TV and the big screen and for stage. Um, the entry of its lexicon into uh, everyday life. It's a really quite extraordinarily influential uh, novel. You Speak, Big Brother, um, Double Think, uh, Thought Crime, uh, Unperson. Uh, then go on to David Bowie and uh, um, um, the uh, uh, adaptation of uh, 1984 as a rock musical in the 1970s that never actually happened. Um, 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 okay, um, really quite extraordinary kind of sweep of, uh, of, uh, uh, um, of uh, uh, um, um, coverage. Takes us right the way through um, to uh, really the age of Trump and Brexit um, in the end. Um, and okay, through all of this, you're extremely critical and sometimes, very often in fact, amusingly rude, may I say, uh, about people you think have got 1984 horribly wrong. Um, uh, seeing it as a prediction of an inevitable future, for example, oh, right, yeah. uh, or as a disavowal of socialism and embrace of capitalism, or as, well, as uh, Milan Kundera put it, merely political thought 
designed, uh, disguised as a novel. Um, uh, who do you think are the worst culprits? <laughs> well, this isn't, I mean, this is Animal Farm rather than 84. The worst, the wrongest you can ever be uh. was Ayn Rand, uh. who thought that Animal Farm was too pro-communist. Um, which, again, I suppose just shows how far right you can actually, you can actually end up. I mean, I don't, the thing is, I don't know why everybody just got it entirely wrong. It was just they didn't necessarily understand the specifics of what he was doing. And I suppose one, the aim of the book was to actually show people, you know, what he was thinking as best I could, you know, and the other things he was writing about. And so, for example, American conservatives, they would see it as anti-Stalinist, equals anti-communist, equals anti-socialist, equals anti-labor. And so they thought it was an attack on Clement Attlee's government, which Orwell was a supporter of. Mm. And I mean, America, I mean, it happens less with the internet, but sometimes, you can still read sometimes Americans writing about British politics and be just like, <laughs> you, you have, it's a different country. Yeah. It's not the same uh, way of thinking. Um, and so, and, he, and again, I suppose, like the CIA tried to, um, I mean, they thought it was a great kind of propaganda weapon and they weren't wrong. It was anti-Stalin very clearly, but then they would try and meddle with it. So there's a kind of the, the fifties animation of animal farm. They kept getting script note. It was part funded by the CIA. So they kept getting script notes in the CIA, um, which was very, um, which kind of mangled it, which was sort of very annoying. And they kept going, could one of the pigs have a moustache? Could Napoleon have a moustache? So that we know that it's, you know, so that we know that it's Stalin. Um, and there was an early suggest, and they, and they kind of had to reduce the role of the farmers because they didn't want to offend the agriculture <laughs> lobby. lobby. <laughs> yeah. um, so you end up with this kind of weird sort of distortion. There's a kind of, there's a, there's a, the 1956 movie has, two endings and one of the endings is happy um i.e they get shot to death but they don't winston julie don't actually kind of love big brother so that's the happy version of 1984 when, mm. where you mm. only get executed um so it's a it was more it wasn't so much that people got it completely wrong it was more that i was just interested in the different things that people could get from it you know that there were, you know, there were Lee Harvey Oswald liked 1984, the Black Panthers liked 1984, yeah. uh, the John Birch Society, who were kind of ultra anti-communists, liked 1984. You know, David Bowie did, Margaret Atwood did, et cetera, et cetera. So it was more like, I, I, I didn't want to judge too many people as being sort of entirely wrong. It was more just to show that if you create something which has this sort of mythic power and this kind of universality, which is great in some ways that you want to apply, you don't want to apply everything, only apply the book to what was happening in the 1940s because people wouldn't be reading it still if that was the case. But you can't forget, I think, what the context was and you can't forget what his personal politics were, what his aims were, what, what his sort of targets were. And so I did, yeah, sometimes you do just have to kind of like have some fun with it. Also, it's a depressing book, and I didn't want to make my book a depressing book. <laughs> so, like, there is humor, and there's humor. There's not much humor in 1984, but there's an enormous amount of humor in Orwell's journalism. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and he was just great at kind of um, poking fun at people. There was this line, I think I managed to squeeze it. It's not particularly relevant, I just wanted to put it in there, where he was making fun of um, Lord Beaverbrook, who ran the Express. And he says there's a picture of him where he goes, looks more mm -hmm. like yes. looks more like a monkey, <laughs> monkey on a monkey. stick than yeah. you would think possible from someone who wasn't doing it on purpose <laughs> yeah. which is just like it's just a it's just a brilliantly sort of funny funny line and so i kind of thought that to try and to get some of his worldview in there yeah no, absolutely okay one last question from me and then throw it open to uh uh, uh questions from all of you um um okay um 
as I said at the start, okay, I'm really massively impressed by the book, loved it, okay? Um, and, well, okay, it's really thoroughly researched, full of new insights, clearly written, witty and fresh, and recommend it strongly to absolutely anyone here who hasn't, hasn't already read it. Um, one final question, okay, what do you reckon is the best further reading on Orwell, okay, after this is it. maybe your, uh, it. your own tone? Yeah. Best biography? I, th I think DJ Taylor's right. is the most, it's, sort of the, it's the most well-written. Yeah. It's sort of, he brings a certain humility to it as well, because some biographers are very keen to be like, I understand this person better than anyone else, and it gets very annoying. Um, and Bernard Crick did all the work, that's the thing. Mm -hmm. Most of what we know about Orwell you know, Bernard Crick found out in his biography. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, if you were just if you just want like a good read, I think D.J. Taylor's. Yes. We ought to get him to come along here as well, actually. Anyway, um, thank you very much. And OK, um, OK, questions. Thank, thank you very much. Um, you, you mentioned a Polish writer who was um, uh, very impressed by Orwell's um, diagnosis of totalitarianism. Um, uh, there is a Polish writer who would fit the bill. I don't know whether it's the one that you you mean. His name, um, from memory, I think, is Milos Czeslaw. I think. Czeslaw Milos. He wrote a book called *The Captive Mind*. Captive Mind. Yeah. No, it's yeah. not no, it's him. It's not him. But he did make, he did make a similar point uh, in the 50s point where he said there were actually communist party, party officials mm. who were just like, how did he know? Like, did he know? But no, this was somebody who no, was writing, was I think in 1984, Index on, Index on Censorship, uh, published, this, uh, published this, this, this amazingly moving amazing essay. Moving essay. But I can't remember because well, in that chapter, there's a chapter where basically I'm talking about, and there was someone from Hungary, there was a Czech writer, there was a Lithuanian. So that's why I'm not sure which one it was. Yeah. But anyway, I, I wanted to ask a question. I, I mean, I haven't read 1984 for so many decades that it's not funny, so you'll have to tell me. But the, the central point of The Captive Mind, which was a huge hit and got him out of um, communist Poland, um, is that it, it is actually a biography of about five hmm. Polish intellectuals and artists whom, you know, if you'd seen, let us say, if you'd, you'd known of their novels or you'd seen films that were made from them, you'd find these very admirable people indeed. But, um, but um, Czeslaw's um, idea is that each one of these um, kind of um, came to a mental accommodation with the state. Um, and um, his term for this was Ketman, which he claimed to have taken from Middle Eastern cultures. I can't remember which country exactly. But in Ketman, you know, um, a person, as it were, kind of speaks back to power, knowingly kind of dissimulating what they know to be true. The thing about Ketman is that everybody has their own personal brand of Ketman. And so he was saying that each of these five, you know, very impressive artists had their own, <laughs> their own Ketman. So I just, just, I mean, is that something that um, is just a slight wrinkle on on the picture of totalitarianism that you get in 1984, or is it entirely, as it were, kind of predictable through it? I've read that. I've read I can't that. quite I remember can't the quite that, remember that, 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 that sort of contours of the argument. Of the argument. I mean, he was, or was, was obviously, I mean, he was obviously interested, interested in how people, in how people lived, lived under totalitarianism and the accommod yeah, and you say the accommodations they make. Most of the characters in 94 do make some kind of accommodation. With, with power, with power. Um, um, and there was a great there was a, there was a review he wrote of a book of from the 30s which was 30s just talking about life in Nazi Germany, in Nazi Germany. And he said it's really interesting, it's really interesting. Mm -hmm. it says, but, but it seems so awful, seems so awful that, you that you can't understand why Hitler had any support, had at, any all. support at all and he sort of wanted he was going he what I'm waiting what for I'm waiting is a book which explains why people go along with it you know, why Hitler you know, was why actually Hitler popular. Was actually popular. Um, um, because it's too easy to just, go, to just go, this, this, this is this dreadful. Is that's dreadful. sort of that's obvious. Sort of obvious. Um, and um, so, 
And so the most important idea in 1984 is double thing. And really, I think the reason really, think sort of it endures is it's not really about the system. Really about the system. It's, about the it's about the psychology. And it's about, and it's about what, that what that does to people. To people. Um, um, and of course, yeah, he, yeah, he, he kind of, um, um, just law finds a whole other set of sort of case studies. To answer the that's same, that's answer the same question. Pretty, 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 yeah. pretty good approximation of Kevin. Thanks. Okay. Uh, in the sort of first few expository chapters of 1984, uh, Orwell writes, to paraphrase, that you don't install a dictatorship to safeguard a revolution, you launch a revolution to install a dictatorship. Mm. Uh, it's not something that I imagine you can answer definitively, but on, based on your understanding and rider reading of, sort of Orwell's life and perspective on things, mm. if he was alive today, observing the world today, do you think he'd be more alarmed by the kind of top-down oppressive regimes that you see around the world in places like Russia, Syria, Saudi Arabia, or the kind of bottom-up censorship, forced conformity that you see in like the American alt-right or some parts of the Labour Party? I mean, the, f I the, mean former, the former, definitely. I mean, yeah. he was more, he was concerned with, with sort of, um, more concerned with, with power and abuses of power. I mean, I do think obviously he would have, as a, as a, as a, as a journalist, you know, he was obviously, he used to be sort of anti-conformity, so he's sort of pro-freedom of speech. Now how, but there's some complexities to that as well. So how you would apply that to the, the, the conversations we have now, um, I mean, I don't know. One of the things I promised myself in the book was I wouldn't say what Orwell would have thought about X or Y. And it was only when I was writing the final chapter where I could just go, well, look, these are characteristics of Trump or Putin, which resemble things that Orwell decried. Uh, uh, when it comes to, I think, you know, people talking about, say, you sort, know, of about, say sort of political, cor politically, politically correct, correct thought, police, thought police, I feel like we're into, like we're into it's a bit squishier, squishier the use of that, use that language. Of that. It wasn't something he was particularly uh, obsessed with. And in fact, there are, you know, things he wrote, which you would say were sort of uh, arguments for political correctness. You know, he was really horrified by the way that... Um, Immigrants were treated. Immigrants were he was horrified by racism horrified towards, by towards uh, African American uh, soldiers American who were stationed soldiers in London, and he was saying we should use the word. Use the word. I can't remember what can't remember exactly, what the, exactly the, the the word was at the, word time. Was at the time, but he was like, well, d use the word that they want to be called by. Don't use this old thing because that's the one that you, you've sort of grown up with. Listen to how they they talk. And so it's sort of in those. I flinch a little bit when I see when I see him sort of being uh, commandeered and sort of arguments about, arguments you, know, about you, know, you know, what you can say on, you can say on campus, campus or so on. I'm not sure if that's exactly, sure that exactly what you mean, but, you mean, but I think all you can do is you can go to the work, go to what he wrote, and sort of draw your own conclusions. Your own and what I wanted to do, because I, do, you know, I don't like being, I really, I don't like overbearing books. I don't like books that kind of tell you what to think. And so what I wanted to do in this book was to present enough sort of enough quotations and arguments and analysis, and analysis but leave people but room leave to people sort of think oh okay this is what I would have thought I know what I, I, know what I the conclusions I draw about what Orwell would have thought about, about, you, know, about you know Brexit but I'm not going to stick that in a book because it just seems kind of a bit, kind of a bit tacky particularly tacky, since I've spent the last few chapters last few having chapters, a go at people who basically dug him up and wheeled his corpse around going well I think you'll find he agrees with me you know because people did that a lot Okay. Mm. Particularly in the, Particularly uh, in the uh, 1980s when there was a there was a real spate of yeah. it. Absolutely. Yeah. It turned out Orwell could read, read with whoever was whoever talking was at that particular time. He was very, very strongly against the use of the word Chinaman to describe uh, Chinese uh, uh, um, uh, people, for example, considering it to be um, offensive because Chinese people didn't like it and argued strongly against its use. Um, for example, what could be more PC than that? But anyway. OK, I mean, mine's a sort of perhaps a bit of a banal question, really, but um, clearly in 1984, Orwell is very interested in how the mind is controlled by a totalitarian regime. 
how d do you think he would respond to the degree to which um, the mind can be controlled in what he would probably see as a free society at the moment, um, perhaps in terms of the degree to which confirmation bias and mm. cognitive mm. dissonance is possible in this society now? Well, I think that's some of his well, most, sort of most sort of more, you know, more, you know, prescient writing, prescient something writing, like an essay like Notes, like on, nationalism, like Notes on Nationalism, where he's describing, yeah, describing things, that were, things that were, that we would now say, would now say oh, that's a filter bubble, oh, that's, that's filter confirmation bubble. bias, that's groupthink, that's group group you know, groupthink, a yeah, word group that was actually word inspired, that was actually by, Orwell inspired by Orwell after his death. Um, so yeah, a lot of the so ways yeah, of in the which ways we talk about, for example, the way that people, you know, you know, we, we talk on the, the, the internet about filter bubbles and confirmation bias. It's like a lot of time what they're, like they're describing is that people like information, like information, that, information confirms that confirms what they want, what to, be they true, want to be true. Which of course is not, course a, is new not thing. a new it's thing. It's just the internet it's makes, the that, internet a lot makes that a lot easier. easier. Um, um, and so, yeah, he was always so, yeah, he was he was fascinated by that. He was fascinated by self-deception. He was fascinated by how you can lie to yourself. He was fascinated by how bias can bias lead you to the wrong conclusions the wrong if you don't realise your bias. Realize your bias. One of my favourite things he wrote was a column. Uh, he wrote a London uh, letter a for London Partisan letter, Review, a New York Review, magazine, just, York magazine, you know, just describing what was yeah, happening in what London, happening. what life London, was like during, life the was like during the war. Um, and um, in, I think, 1944, and in, I think 1944, he wrote one, he wrote which is dedicated one, to explaining all the things he got wrong in his previous columns, which, columns, columns, which I think every newspaper column should newspaper be forced column to do forced on an annual basis. And he's going, well, this I was wrong about, but to be honest, everyone was wrong. You know, I don't blame myself. This... I was, I was wrong about because about actually I had an unexamined bias, etc., etc. Et et he, et he was going. He was again he was a phrase that didn't exist, exist at the time. He was, really he was really against doubling down. Doubling down. He was like when was people like, when are people found, to be, found to be wrong, instead of kind of just justifying, of justifying it, they should think, okay, should why, think, okay, why, why was I wrong? He was quite obsessive about that, and that's the kind of stuff that I think is incredibly helpful and and sort of. You know, and genuinely you know, inspiring. Genuinely this is inspiring. one of the ways in which, so writing the book has actually changed the way that I behave. You know, it's just you know, thinking it's just you see thinking a certain thing, thing, on certain thing on Twitter and you go, well, this would be convenient for my argument. And then that's when I stop and, and go, stop. but is it actually true? You started to say the line, um, which, which I think, you know, in paraphrasing, every line, I, everything I've written since 1936. And yeah. you didn't finish it. Yeah. And I think the end of it is something that has been against totalitarianism and for democratic socialism as I know it. Yes. Yeah. I think that's one of the most significant things, uh, you know, that he wrote. And, you know, it, it's been, as you've very sort of accurately, entertainingly and insightfully kind of uh, debunked, you know, the, appropriate, the appropriation of 1984 by the right... Um, um, and I, I just and sort of wanted to um, link it to what, how you opened the, the, the Ministry of Truth by looking at, you know, President Trump. And I just wanted to, you know, see this sort of this connection where President Trump, for example, who, as you pointed out, has said, you know, hundreds of misleading things, but he himself keeps calling other people out on fake news. Is is a, is a, is a sort of typical you know, right-wing sort of Orwellian tactic. Um, could you just sort of elaborate a bit on that? Because I think you're very interesting on Trump. You use Trump at the beginning and you, use, and you end on Trump. Um, and, and does it sort of have, have this link to the, this complete misrepresentation of Orwell's politics by currently the most powerful person in the world? Um, does Trump... Does Trump misrepresent? misrepresent? I don't know. Trump reads. The way he calls out the others on oh, fake right. news, and oh, he right. himself is guilty of fake news, uh, is a, is an Orwellian yeah. thing to do. The thing about the thing about Trump is that he's Trump sort of he's I sort think of, is that he just I doesn't know. know. He's the next. He's the, next, he's the sort of the next step. The next step. In, a way, in a way, is that. Is that Orwell generally, Orwell generally thought that the people that, that, that were lying just were knew lying, that it wasn't true. It wasn't so that true. when the, so that when the uh, uh, you know when the Soviets you know, lied the about Soviets the poom and said they're collaborating with Franco, he sort of he sort of he still kind of thought that they knew that that wasn't true and they were just going to lie because it was convenient. 
Um, Trump doesn't um, know. Trump doesn't know. And so he lives in this and sort of constant kind of like psychedelic postmodern post state, post state in which the truth is whatever he needs it to be at that particular point. I mean, it's basically double, sort of double think incarnate. And so it's very hard to sort of know sometimes, does he know that he's lying? Or has he just constructed a kind of, does he just live in his own mad mind palace? And so that's where you just go, so okay, he's not big brother. He's not, big he's, not brother. he's not cunning and cunning manipulative, and manipulative enough, enough, but he is a kind of like kind embodiment, of, like embodiment of post-truth when you've almost sort of given up, sort of given up the, idea the idea that things that, that, are, inconvenient that are inconvenient to you could still be true. Uh, yeah, that's where I kind of yeah, found him like an, found an interesting like figure to write about in this context, this context because I do think that do think it's too that easy to say so and so is Orwellian. It's too easy to say so and so is fascist. You know, Trump is not a fascist, yeah, not a fascist but it's worth, but it's worth looking, at looking at the things that he does that, he does that, are, that are fascistic. You know what I mean? Not, you know what I mean? not, not just sort of labeling people, because then I think that always stops you thinking. And then you just put it in the kind of bad. It in the kind of bad. It's like you, I think you, it's, it's like, I think worthwhile. He was always trying to work out. Always trying to work out what is new about, about, this about this phenomenon. Why is totalitarianism not just the, Spanish, just Inquisition the Spanish, with, Spanish Inquisition with you know, you know electrodes and aeroplanes? What's, what's, what's different about it? About and I think if you're talking about Trump, you always have to work out what is what is new. Hello, thank you very much. I, I just wanted to maybe take you back to the historical context of Orwell and I was quite interested in your discussion about the intellectual kind of legacy and intellectual history mm. with mm. which he was engaging. Um, and I, I mean, I work in modernist literature but I don't really um, know very much about Orwell shamefully so I would really like to ask you maybe to expand a bit more on that kind of intellectual history tradition that he was engaging with, and in particular whether there were any women in that tradition or any non-white socialists in that tradition, um, in kind of, yeah, basically mm. did he read anyone who wasn't a white guy? <laughs> and then the second question, if I may, is about the function of the political novel in terms of 1984, and particularly I mean, you spoke about your position on Orwell's treatment of women characters and women in his personal life, um, and maybe would like to just hear what you ha what your thoughts are on what o Orwell thinks women in politics and in political life can do, because, for example, Virginia Woolf has this famous essay called Three Guineas, where she wrote it in 1937 where she writes specifically about this kind of the correlation between like fascism and the patriarchy mm. and how the patriarchy and fascism are kind of born from the same seed. So from that perspective, I just would like to hear what you have to say in terms of, yeah, um, the correlation between the two, please, okay. if that's okay. Well, in the, in the first one, I'd say in the, in the context of that time, he was re he, his reading was diverse in the sense that he was reading people from um, Lots of, lots of different countries. countries. I mean, a lot of people actually had a very kind of like <laughs> Anglo-centric Anglo view. Yeah. And a lot of his, the, the writers he thought were most powerful on, on um, totalitarianism, totalitarianism, you know, they were French you know, or they, they were, were Polish French or they were Russian. Or they were Russian. Um, um, I don't, I'm trying to yeah, think of, he really think liked, he really um, liked um, Native Son. Native Son. If I'm remembering rightly. I'm remembering rightly. I, think really I think he really liked Richard Wright. Richard Wright. Um, mm. and, and there were there were there kind were, of there were kind of Anand. Anand. Oh right. Oh right. Um, but then he um, was. But I'm not sure whether he. Yeah. 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 So. Yes. Indian, uh, uh, Indian, uh, 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 Indian uh, 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 novelist uh, and uh, a poet was regular uh, on BBC uh, with him. Uh, in terms of feminist and women writers who were very influential on him, although. We fell out with the one that he was closest to, Rebecca West, um, because she was a pacifist in the Second World War and he wasn't. 
Um, but uh, they've been great mates. Um, um, I think they made up. I don't know. Did they? I can say. Anyway, Mary Louise Benary, who was the uh, uh, wife of Vernon Richards, one of his best anarchist uh, uh, friends, was in her own right. Uh, um, uh, well, a, a serious uh, a, a political kind of uh, um, writer. Well, the book I'd recommend if you want to, if you're talking about patriarchy and fascism, is uh, Swastika Night by mm. Catherine Burdekin, who wrote it under the name Murray Constantine. Uh, do you know that one? Uh, right, no, there you go. Right, um, there you go. And um, I think he must have read that, although he never wrote that, about it. I think, think it was too much, it was in his orbit. And there were a lot of interesting, it's like Naomi Mitchison, Storm Jameson. There was, who, is the, who there am I was thinking of the writer who wrote the, writer the play Take Back, Back Your Freedom? Freedom. Winifred Holtby. Winifred Holtby. I mean, yeah. so there, were, there were kind of plenty, plenty, of, plenty of women plenty writing women about, particularly writing, writing about these kind of what if fascism comes to Britain? Comes to Britain. What yeah. form would that what take? Evelyn Anderson, um, who uh, 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 worked with him on Tribune, uh, wrote about German fascism, um, um, uh, uh, New Left, sorry, not New Left Book Club, Left Book Club edition that uh, 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 sold. Um, um, you know, sort of several hundred thousand copies. They're not people. Well, some of these people are not people that are well known uh, today, but they're very. They're, they're, they are very important in the in the in the forties political media. Very important, and in in in, in literary terms as well. Um, and I'm, this is kind of off the top. Well, it's not I'm certain in my case off the top of my head, rather than something that I've actually given. Well, I just want to say that I, 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 the, <laughs> the promise. The promise. The promise are things that was didn't really think about. Mm -hmm. And there were lots of things he just wasn't interested, interested in, you know, which included yeah, like, which you know, sports, like, you know, sports, 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 sports and Hollywood and, mm. and whatever. <laughs> and unfortunately, and he didn't really think much think about, much about feminism, feminism, and gender issues. And it's, and it's a shame because a shame you kind of think, oh, I'd love to know what you would have written about. It was almost like he didn't, it just didn't sort of figure, you know, and he's thinking that much, even though he was, you know, he was surrounded by a lot of these kind of, you know, Sort of yeah. fascinating, kind of inspiring, kind of inspiring uh, women. Uh, women. So it's sort of a, so it's, it's, sort like of a it's like a blind spot, I think, as opposed think to something where he took a very strong position of just like, mm. I don't like that. Don't like that. Mm. You know, a, a strong position of opposition. It was just more like, it, d it didn't kind of cross his radar as often as I think it, it should have done. And you kind of think, well, you know, the people that he knew, the writers that were around at the time, yeah. Yeah, no, I was just asking because, yeah, thank you for all the, uh, the names that you mentioned because that's a really interesting avenue for me to kind of uh, investigate. And I also asking because, like, if his writing falls into this tradition of working class political writing where people like Somerville and Gibbons, they write the same kinds of no similar kind of novels about political struggle um, and the same criticism of how they handle women is aimed at them in terms of how women are always kind of reluctant to take up radical political action and they're always more inclined to kind of settling and trying to find ways to mitigate the terrible circumstances in which they're put. So it kind of falls oh, right. yeah, no, right. I think that's the problem if, if you just yeah. read it, Julia as if like that, Julia, that's, that's what he thought about women because a lot of the women, he knew, including, his, um, including, his, um, including his mother, mm. including his mother who was kind of, you know, moved in kind of like yeah, socialist and socialist Fabians and the suffragettes. Yeah. So it was like he so certainly like didn't believe <coughs> that like, <coughs> you know, he certainly didn't believe that about women that just because Julia herself is not. Yeah. And it has to be said, Julia does, said, rebel. Julia does rebel. Julia does risk, Julia her, does life. risk her life. You know, it, it's not like she's solely, like she's solely uh, a cynic. Uh, yeah, no, thank you very much. Um, so um, Orwell lived in a time that was like where human race were more or less ignorant. So if Orwell was alive today, do you think he would call this society a utopia or a dystopia? Well, now? Yeah, now. if he were alive. I think he'd probably just see the consistencies. See the mm -hmm. I mean, it's less dystopian, I mean, it's less dystopian than, than World War II. So would you society is progressing or regressing? I don't know whether. I don't know whether. I just don't know how much he believed in. I mean, he, the, he, I, mean, I don't know, he, know whether how much he believed in progress as an idea. As an idea. He, certainly he certainly believed in progressive, progressive things. things. 
you know, and so if you looked you know, at him so looked at particular, particular sort of policies or ideas, he certainly believed that you could make things better. You did, no, you did believe in like, but you didn't believe in perfection. So he wasn't utopian. He was like, but you can make things better. And he felt that actually some people, because they gave up on utopianism, they almost gave up on the idea that anything could ever be better. And he really hated what he called the, you know, the kind of the pessimistic conservatives that were just like nothing ever changes. However, he had that streak in him as well. So he was this very... When Anthony said that Anthony essay, he says democratic that socialism, that socialism, socialism as I see it. As I see and the thing, it. Is, the thing is that his version of socialism basically, basically applied to one person, one him. Person. Like it was so idiosyncratic so and he had so many competing, so many competing instincts in instincts him and in his in background, him, background. Um, um, that it's sort of what he thought what was he just, thought was I think, really, really specific, really to, him. specific to him. And, you know, which was and good in a way because he didn't subscribe to an ideology. He didn't, ideology. He didn't claim to be speaking for other people. Um, but I do think but that I that means that, that it would be, he would neither say would utopia, utopia say nor dystopia because I think he believed in sort of neither. He never thought things would get, you know, to go to those extremes. And the whole point of 1984 is just going, you know, presenting the worst possible scenario, not that he actually thought that that would be the case. You know, he didn't even think, he didn't think that Soviet Russia was what he described in 1984. He didn't think Nazism was. He was basically going in that kind of Swiftian way. What if it went, it was as bad as it could possibly be? And that's the novel. That's the, novel. That's the, warning. That's the warning. But I don't think he believed, think he believed that that would ever actually that happen, ever actually happen. To, that extent. to that extent. I'm just curious what you think. I'd like to just extend on Anthony's point about fake, fake news. I think one of the things that feeds that is the idea of brainwashing people. And that's also quite a prominent concept in 1984, where certain characters have to act, feel, think the way that Big Brother tells them to. Mm. So I think that's certainly a warning that we can take from the novel, one of many warnings. So what my question is, is what do you think are some of the key warnings or, perhaps, or, or warnings that you think that we can take from the book moving forward into the future? Well, the one that I kind of find most powerful is just that is kind of to, to monitor how you think because it's sort of easier said than done so it is about checking um, it is about checking your biases and your assumptions and in the ways that you can be dishonest um, a warning against ideology and basically almost outsourcing your thinking to a, a, another group or another system um, so a lot of it, a lot of stuff that I've already used is, is sort of psychological um, and really, one way, he really he was really into privacy. He was, you know, in a, in a kind of quiet, just a sort of he had a sort of eccentric Englishman kind of way. He had a real fear of being like sort of spied on. Um, and so it's sort of weird that that particular thing, and some you know some observations of totalitarianism as well, but very much also there's just this emotional desire for privacy, means that it seems relevant when you're talking about. Uh, you know, Facebook's data collection or facial recognition scanners. Um, and so there's, there's a lot in there which is relevant, but of course he had no idea. And it certainly made me slightly more, it's made me more guarded, you know, that I won't do facial recognition. Um, I, you know, I'll avoid, I'll, I'm much more cautious about things. I won't have a, I'm sure it's made me much more suspicious of like Amazon Echo. It's made me think a lot more about data collection and privacy. There's an amazing, uh, there's an amazing sort of anecdote which I'm trying to cram into. I discovered it after the book, so I'm trying to cram it into the paperback. Um, where when they did the stage version of 1984, they did a, a project with King's College London where they just developed a, a, an app a, which was meant to sort of tell you what your digital self was. It was called the digital double. And in the terms and conditions, which they knew nobody would read, it licensed the theatre to take images from your social media accounts and project them in the foyer of the theatre. And they thought that what would happen was that people would be shocked by this and go, they didn't realise they'd signed over their data, you know, the permissions, and they would sort of th be, think twice. And they were actually worried that people would get very angry in, in the foyer. They thought there might be a bit of trouble. And instead, basically, everybody was delighted 
because they were like, it's me. <laughs> and I think that is something that it's, it's a good sort of lesson to just think a little bit more about the information that you give away. And it's really hard. I give away lots. I'm on Twitter and I'm on Facebook. And, uh, you know, I buy from various online stores. There's lots of information that is a, known about me. But I do think just a sense of occasionally drawing the line and just thinking about the fact that these companies, that big tech has become far more dystopian uh, than I think people imagined. If you read about what people are writing about the internet, some of it's in the, in the book, in the 90s, it's just <laughs> madness. It's just kind of like, well, when ev information is <laughs> free and everybody can just share stuff, it, you know, dictatorships will be impossible. Yeah. And you're just like, mugs. <laughs> it's like reading a 19th century utopian novel. It's like you've no idea what, what's coming. And so I, for, for me, I think it, a lot of it is, you know, I, if I could change political systems, I would. But I think there's a lot you can do just as an individual to just be more thoughtful, to just be more careful. I still see friends, really intelligent people, retweeting madness. <laughs> And you're just like, this is obviously false. Why have you, wh how can you n be so technologically naive to just believe this kind of bullshit? And that's the thing. And when people talk about fake news, they kind of they think, oh, it's over there. It's just like, I can't believe these idiots are falling for that. But I've fallen for it. Everyone's, everyone on social media has fallen for it at some point. And you know, I have to kind of gently or not so gently tell friends, just like, that's a made up conspiracy theory from a, you know, a fake site. Or this account doesn't actually exist. This person you're arguing with, John Smith 40734, you know, doesn't exist. It's obviously doesn't exist. So I suppose it's just, it's just thinking harder. There's a really great Christopher Hitchens line about Orwell where he says he doesn't tell you what to think. He it sort of teaches you how to think. And I think that's the thing I felt certainly writing about him. I was like, I don't agree with everything Orwell said. It'd be a bit weird if I did agree with someone who died 70 years ago <laughs> um, about everything. But I did agree with the way that he was trying to think and the way that he was asking himself questions. And the only times he fell down, I think, is when he just didn't ask, he forgot to ask himself those questions. So those little biases or prejudices that, that crept through, <coughs> and you kind of think, damn, you missed that one. But he examined his thinking more than anybody else, I think, of, his, of, of that time, or this time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>